All right, hello everybody and uh, welcome to the last session of the Double Line Client Event, or I should say the Virtual Client Event. And uh, I've entitled this, sec uh, this segment, Equity Markets, Where Do We Go From Here? And so I think it's a, a good time to refresh investors of, of thinking about what's going on in the equity markets. We've heard uh, from a couple of titans this morning in our conversation with uh, Jeffrey Gunlock and Felix Zuloff. Uh, as I said, some of that's a precursor, but what I really want to do is dig under the hood of some of the valuation metrics and things going on within the equity markets, because uh, as with most uh, investments out there, what you see by doing a drive-by analysis, look at the high level, isn't always what's going on underneath the hood. So that's what we're going to examine today. Uh, so what I wanted to really focus on, and, and this is nothing groundbreaking here, is that uh, th this first section is entitled, or is titled, I keep saying entitled, uh, it's titled uh, Equity Market Concentration. And this will be no surprise to anyone who focuses on the equity markets that um, there's been significant concentration risk within the U.S. equity market. And I think this was something that was referenced in, in the session earlier this morning, but looking at the CAPE ratio of the U.S. equity market, and this only goes back, and I say only goes back uh, roughly 40 years or so on looking at the valuation of the U.S. equity market relative to long-term earnings. And so the CAPE ratio uh, looks at the price of the market today relative to the trailing tw uh, 10 years of earnings, and it's on an inflation-adjusted basis. So unlike uh, a lot of metrics you'll see on Wall Street where the price range ratio is on a very short time frame, typically 12 months, and it can also be 12 months forward, uh, the CAPE ratio tries to look through an entire cycle of the market, hence the 10-year uh, perspective. And uh, Professor Schiller is the one who created this along with one of his students, John Campbell, and when you, if, you, if you want a more detail here, uh, you can go to his website and see that he calculates the CAPE ratio back to the 1870s. So uh, that's why I say even as a 40-year view, it's a, it's a little bit narrow relative to the data available. Uh, but if you look at this uh, data set, what you see is that the valuation on a trailing tw uh, 10 years earnings, again, inflation-adjusted earnings, um, it shows that the price that one pays for the U.S. equity market is only rivaled one time in history, and that was during the tech boom of the late late 90s and, and beginning of the 2000s. And so, uh, although uh, the the market looks a bit rich on this valuation, or or pretty rich on this valuation, there's nothing that precludes it from getting richer. And as Mr. Gunlock said this morning, uh, one of those things that could be doing that is the low level of interest rates as well. Although if you talk to Professor Schiller, uh, he would say that those are the narratives that transcend markets. And in fact, uh, that was a narrative used uh, many times to rationalize the equity market. But what does the CAPE ratio really tell you? As I remind people, it's a valuation metric and a valuation metric can, should not be used as a market timing signal. It should be used as thinking about prospective returns. And here's a perspective of thinking about using the CAPE ratio and since uh, it is um, it is a 10-year perspective of earnings. Uh, one way to uh, think about forward-looking returns is use a long-term perspective as well. And if you look at the uh, the subsequent 10-year returns based on the valuation of the CAPE ratio, uh, what you can see here is different regimes. And so these different regimes uh, are are what the starting valuation of the CAPE ratio. Right, so that is that is dictated uh, by the color coding here. So when the CAPE ratio has been above 30, what is the subsequent 10 year, and notice this is real rate of return. And so there's a, a distribution of returns here. So not just taking kind of the average experience or some regression based formula, but actually looking at the historical distribution of returns. And you can see here that uh, if you look at the horizontal axis, what you see is that, well, the returns tend to be the highest, Right, and they tend to be, you know, especially on a frequency distribution basis, when the CAPE ratio is below 20. And in fact, the highest rate of returns tend to be when the CAPE ratio is less than 10. So, although we do have a CAPE ratio north of 30 today, it does not preclude an investor from having a negative rate of return. Again, this is in a real sense, so inflation-adjusted type of returns. So, what it's trying to tell you is that. Valuation is rich, and so it's a, it's a it's an exercise in framing one's expectation about forward-looking returns. Again, I don't have to remind most of you of this, but it's it's something that should be fed into your analysis on the equity markets. And if you look at earnings, and this is quarterly earnings, I think it's it's really important to to think about what happened last year uh, through the pandemic, and 
even though uh, typically in a recession, what you see is that you'll see earnings uh, decelerate massively and in some instances go extremely negative. And we didn't see that from the pandemic because uh, what you found was that some of the leadership or the more outsized type of uh, exposures within the U.S. equity market uh, were the ones that were driving earnings. And so even though there was a fall off significant expectations of, of earnings per share, and so this is the quarterly earnings per share, uh, so it's each quarter uh, instead of looking at annualized, which a lot of people do, notice what you've seen in the recovery in earnings. So. Thinking back to pre-pandemic levels, uh, that would say uh, fourth quarter of 2019. And if you can look in, and look on, on the graph there, you'll see that our earnings per share on the U.S. stock market at the fourth quarter of, of 19 was roughly around $39 per share. And now if you look at where we are in the cycle, the expectations for Q1, and, and they're probably a little bit higher today given that uh, to date about 88% of companies have beat earnings, the expectations are above those pre those those areas as well and so when i look at you know what's what's uh, happening here in the trends is that you can see that earnings have recovered from pre-covid levels and not shockingly uh, if you look about the amount of stimulus we've done we, we've harped on this to death uh, over the last two days uh, but we've put money into people's hands there is a reopening of the economy people are getting back to work although we still have you know, somewhere around 16 million people displaced within the jobs market uh, prior to pandemic levels, or at least 16 million people uh, receiving some form of benefits today. Um, there's roughly about eight and a half million jobs to go to, to replace where we were prior. Um, you can see that earnings are expected to really get significantly above pre-pandemic levels. So remember, the equity market is a forward discounting mechanism, so it's already thinking about these metrics into the system. But what's interesting too, and, and again, what we see here, and this shouldn't be shocking to anybody uh, that follows the equity market, is that if you look at the performance of the markets over the last six years, it's been driven by what I'll call here the FANM stocks. And so notice that's F-A-A-A-N-M, which stands for Facebook, Apple, Alphabet, Amazon, Netflix, and Microsoft. And these have been the big six. These big six stocks have driven the market. They've also, as I'll show, driven a fair amount of earnings. But what I find it really interesting about this graphic is that if you look at the what I'll call the S&P 494, the remaining market capitalization of the S&P 500 x these big six, you'll see that the performance of those securities has roughly been equal to the rest of the world x us so notice that the u.s exceptionalism it's a phrase i hear a lot uh, i've always taken uh, exception to it uh, no pun intended but this u.s exceptionalism has been in the technological sector of the dominant stocks of the world and so in order to really be bold up on these securities you really have to think that the rest of the world is going to grow extremely slow and that these companies are ultimately going to take over the world and why why i give that perspective is that in the history of humankind, uh, no, no single company has ever taken over the world. Some have tried, uh, but they've been very unsuccessful. And a lot of that has to do with regulation or, you know, uh, again, those oligop oligopolic or monopolistic powers uh, tend to really threaten governments. And so from that perspective, um, just playing that seed in there, not to say that these will be more regulated over time. What you find here is that there is value potentially in some of these, or at least they don't have such outsized performance um, uh, relative to the overall market. And so if I look at the earnings perspective, um, maybe investors were actually doing the right thing. Uh, again, the phantom stocks, I'm trying to, to say that with the AAA in there, it's not really English. But if you look at those stocks, what you see is that they've also delivered on performance. And so high valuation coupled with significant earnings growth just keeps high valuation where it's at. So a, a, a contrarian or someone would say, well, Jeff, you know, I look at, the, look at the stock market and it was expensive going into the pandemic. It's just as expensive now and look at my rate of return. And the answer is yes, Remember, valuation doesn't have to mean revert over the short term, but we tend to see things over the medium term. But notice earnings. Earnings here within the S&P 494, as, I am as I'm defining it here, has really been in line with the earnings of the rest of the world. So potentially, maybe things aren't as irrational as you think when you strip out some of the high flyers.
And so um, what's also amazing, what you can do is taking the same type of analysis here. Um, and <clears throat> what you find is that if you look at the relative premium of what people pay for these fandom stocks, relative to the rest of the uh, rest of the securities within the US uh, S&P 500 is that that premium is very very significant. So again, earnings don't mean revert, typically valuations do, and perhaps this S&P 494 is much more attractive uh, than what people think when they look at the broad based S&P 500. And so um, if anybody out there is an ETF creator, uh, I expect to see one of these S&P 494 uh, ETFs on the horizon soon, just based on this analysis. And within under the hood too, because those phantom stocks, as I'm calling them, um, are predicated on the growth market, uh, what you've seen is a continued distortion of the value versus growth expectations. And so what we are, I'm sorry, value versus growth performance. And again, this is with the benefit of hindsight. So if you look at what we've done here, we compare the S&P 500 value component to the S&P 500 growth component. And again, no one's gonna be shocked by this. Value has significantly underperformed for over a decade now. In fact, um, value only, uh, the last time value really outperformed growth was pre-financial crisis. And so this, this feeds into narratives where people think, well, there's never gonna be value again, there's no resurgence, uh, but there's just been this demand for technology and these growth stocks for many, many years. And so again, it's not just the, the six high flyers within the S&P 500, it's the overall growth component of the market. And I like to remind people that after a recession, when the recession physically ends, and uh, to date the NBER has not uh, officially declared the end of the recession, and they haven't done so, I believe, not because of economic performance, but because there's still a drag from the labor market. And uh, we have many macroeconomic slides. If you tune into any of our last latest webcasts, we always cover the dynamics of the labor market. But what you find is that it's really been um, you know, this reflation, this resurgence, and the new expansionary environment is typically when you see value really perform well, and especially due to the cyclical nature of some of the value stocks. And, and here, this one's gonna be a little more, um, um, this is gonna be a little bit uh, difficult to read here, but you can take our slides and you can download them. What you see is here is it's not just using some price to book ratio. Uh, a lot of people have criticized the value premium and said, well, it's an archaic way of thinking about it. Price to book is not the best way to think about equities. So what if you actually took the historical price to book, uh, the premium that one pays for growth stocks over value over the long period of time? And this is uh, going back to the mid 90s. And you can see here that there's this, uh, there's this traditional premium. We take the average there and we show the standard deviation bands. And you can see that price to book is about four standard deviations. Our value is four standard deviations cheap said differently, growth is four standard deviations cheap on a price to book basis um, relative to the value sector of the market. And so what I wanted to do was dispel the myth that it's just simply price to book that's that's going out here. Um, what we're actually looking at is many metrics. So price to sales being another one. Price to sales says, hey, you know, growth is not as expensive as price to book. It's only three standard deviations cheap. Um, so it's only three standard deviations rich instead of four. So I, I'm being tongue in cheek there because what happens if you look at you know forward looking rates? Well, if you look at forward look, I'm sorry, forward looking price to earnings, you still see okay, it's not as bad. It's only one and a half standard deviations uh, expensive on growth. Same thing, enterprise value to EBITDA, very favorite metric of many managers out there, both growth and value. Again, two standard deviations expensive of growth relative to value. So here, here for investors out there looking for opportunities and. We all have to stay allocated within the U.S. equity market. You know, really thinking about rotation to some of these securities that exhibit a cheaper behavior looks like a very attractive proposition. Plus, we have the catalyst for a lot of these stories to really continue to take off um, as we talk about the inflationary aspects, the interest rate components, as well as the cyclicality of, of the economic data. And so said differently, and again, this one's gonna be a little more difficult to read. You need to zoom in and blow this up. But what we've done here too is take a look, and our equity team did a great job on this, of, of pulling all this data together. They actually wrote a white paper out there. I encourage everyone to download it. Uh, if you don't wanna download it, you just want a copy of it, uh, reach out to your client service rep to do so. It's a great paper, lots of good charts, and that's where um, it, 
this analysis is where a lot of this come from. But if you look at kind of the historical quartile rankings of many different metrics and looking at the various growth premium, what you find is that no matter really what metric you look at, growth screens extremely expensive relative to value on a historical basis. And so um, what we're looking at here on the upper side is, is looking at just the aggregate market um, to try to distill this down and say, what if we excluded mega caps? And so mega cap stocks, um, we have the definitions within here. Uh, you still see that growth screens expensive. I have a question here. I said, if you remove the six exception stocks, what happens to growth? Well, let's exclude the mega caps. So I knew your question was coming there. That's why it's in the presentation. But the next thing, what if you just took out sectors of the market, such as tech and telecom, right? The reason for tech and telecom, again, high flying sectors of the market. There was some distortion of valuations back in the late 90s. So what happens if you use this quartile distribution? Once again, you see all those dots are near highs or at least above the top quartile. And then lastly, what happens if you take the top 10% of the highest valuation? So now this is really cheating. So how cheap is the market if you screen out the most expensive stocks? So it's not exactly your question in there on the six exceptions, but we're just trying to slice and dice the market different ways. And what you see here, really these metrics don't screen any differently. And the quartile, I'm sorry, the scatter plots or the percentile distribution show you that you're at nosebleed levels of growth relative to value. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, if you're going to pay significant price for growth, you better think that growth is scarce, right? You pay a premium for something when there's scarcity, right? So if there's scarce growth, which I don't think that's the case today, we're talking about GDP, uh, you know, having a record year this year. Yes, even in cumulative basis, it's going to be quite strong. Uh, you look at inflation, you're seeing these metrics that say, you know, maybe growth isn't as scarce as we thought because of the underlying catalyst of the market. So again, if you're thinking about some rotation or how to re-sculpt an equity portfolio, potentially screening on some of these metrics can help you and active management in the equity space can also help you as well. Another way to think about this is to say, what if I just looked at the sectors of the overall market? And most of you are familiar with the fact that we run a product that uses Professor Schiller's CAPE ratio to allocate capital across the four cheapest sectors of the US equity market. And that metric that we use is something called the relative CAPE ratio. So what the relative CAPE ratio does is it takes each sector's CAPE ratio. So just like uh, I showed in the first slide, you can calculate each sector's CAPE ratio. And then from there, you compare it to its own history. And in this case, the denominator of that calculation is the 20 year history of that sector's CAPE ratio. So it's not looking at the CAPE ratio of a sector relative to the market, it's looking at it relative to its own history. And notice what you see here, that there's times where sectors of the market scream cheap relative to the history. All of them scream cheap post-financial crisis early on. There's a part where a lot of them scream expensive, right? But also there's periods of time where things scream, there's, there's some divergence across these parts of the market. And that's really something to think about as well. And so even for the value trade, uh, if you notice the, the, the uh, strong performance of the energy complex, uh, energy was the worst performing sector last year on the equity side. It's been one of the best performing sectors, but notice what that relative CAPE ratio uh, is showing you today. In fact, it's an all-time high of relative CAPE ratios for any sector of the market, and we actually had to widen the axes for the latest print here. So you have to be cognizant of what is one is paying here. But you see here, if you look at the sectors of the market, communication services, that's the old telecom, uh, staples, real estate, financials, and technology are on the cheaper sides of the equation. So again, looking at ways to deploy capital in here, sometimes instead of just thinking about individual security selection, thinking about what are the cheaper parts of the market. Another thing I like about this process, and again, we're biased, we run a product based on this, um, so the caveat is there is also sometimes portfolio management is avoiding things. If you listen to my conversation with Robert Cohen yesterday, that's where we talk about inactive management. Sometimes the best management is just avoiding things that are extremely expensive. That can help you outperform. It can also help you avoid significant drawdowns. So um, as always, don't get caught up in narratives, do your fundamental analysis, and think about how that, uh, that translates into deploying capital within the US markets. So another thing I want to touch on is the U.S. versus the rest of the world. 
And so um, one, of, one of the analysts on my team decided that we should call this sector the case for equity diversification, as if we didn't already uh, know that we had to have it. But we're going to try to argue that people have been under allocated to the global uh, equity markets. They've been over allocated to the, uh, the U.S. market. And for those that have done so, it's been great. So pat yourself on the back, take a victory lap, um, but you also have to think about potential on a go-forward basis. And so uh, what we created on this chart is something you've probably seen in many of our webcasts is the S&P 500 versus the rest of the world. So in this case, we use the MSCI ACWI. ACWI stands for All Country World Index, so that includes both developed and emerging markets, and we strip out the U.S. or, or the folks at, at MSCI do. And notice here we've indexed this to what we, at the time, was the peak in global equity markets. And if you look back in early, and that was January 2018, if you look and look at the performance over the preceding couple of years, markets really moved in lockstep. This US exceptionalism that people talk, talk about really happened post January 2018. And notice the divergence in performance. And so the red line is the S&P, uh, the ACWI XUS is what's in blue. And you can see here, even with the strength in the ACWI, it's kind of went sideways for the last, you know, on a year to date basis. It's slightly up. You can decide to see we've hit these top levels. But notice what's happened here is that relative ratio, if you look at the bottom line, has really formed this triple top pattern. And so what that means is that the US is really, although we've outperformed year to date, this gives you some cover to say, okay, well, you know what? Even if I miss this rotation, I still have time to get into it. Just like we've been talking about with interest rates across many of our presentations today, you, you already have the chance to hit the reset button because yields have come down a little bit from the peaks that we saw earlier in the year. So if you didn't like that experience or you've been overweight the U.S., you still have time. Now, this is just looking at relative performance. It doesn't talk about fundamentals. Um, but what I also want to look at is how the long-term perspective looks. And so if I go back to the previous slide real quick, what you see here is that it looks like, well, the U.S. just kind of always outperforms, right? And so why wouldn't I continue to bet on that horse? Well, this horse has only been running here since, you know, uh, let's see, it's, it's early 2015. But if we take it back, you'll see that there's periods of outperformance in various markets. So there's different types of environments that show you um, that the European stock market or the Japanese stock market, or the emerging market stock market uh, can actually outperform the U.S. So uh, we have a lot of investors out there that haven't ever seen that in their careers today. But if you notice here, what's very interesting is the rest of the world, XUS, looks like it's about to break out. So I'll call this a double top on the long term. That is, if you look at where we are today, it matches the previous high we, we saw before. And But notice the U.S. It has really, really taken off pre, uh, I'm sorry, post global financial crisis. So uh, again, this doesn't say that the, the rest of the world is cheap, but if you do see this from a technician standpoint, um, if this does break out, you definitely want to ride that trend. And that, that's the way you think about it from a technical uh, analyst standpoint. So shout out to our CMTs out there and the ones that help us analyze charts here at DoubleLine. And if we go back to, and those are just very naive views that I gave you. But if you go back and look at the CAPE ratio of various parts of the market, we already know what the U.S. looks like. I showed you that in the previous, um, early in the presentation. Right now, you see the blue line that shows you that CAPE ratio. But notice when you look at the rest of the developed world. Well, it doesn't trade at a cheap multiple to history, but it's nowhere near expensive as it's been over the last 40 years. Same with emerging markets. Emerging markets are kind of on average those levels, but nowhere near what we saw in the commodity super cycle in the aughts. But also, if you look at the rest of the world, it's a lot cheaper. So thinking about deploying capital here, at least there's more room for error, right? When I say more room for error, you can make a little more price mistakes because ultimately you're paying simply less for the earnings. So on this CAPE ratio, it definitely looks cheap as well. And uh, I, I, I borrowed this chart from the folks at JP Morgan. Uh, they put out a great uh, a guide to the markets every single quarter. And I thought it was very interesting when we were talking about this perspective is that if you just now take the EFA. So what I've been focused on thus far is the MSCI ACWI, the all country. This is developed plus emerging markets. EFA stands for Europe. Australasia and the Far East. Don't know where they created the word Australasia, uh, but they wanted to get uh, the developed world of Asia and Australia in there. So that's where that comes from. So the EFA or EFI as some people call it, 
Uh, notice that we have these cycles. These cycles tend to run you know, a few years to really seven or eight years about performance. In the history of the IFE, uh, you've never seen the, the IFE or the US outperform by what you've seen over the last 13 and a half years. So again, if the, it doesn't say the tide's about to turn any anytime soon, but again, given the setup, given the cheapness, as well as given both our view and what I heard from Mr. Zuloff this morning uh, on, on the view of the dollar, remember the dollar, if you're buying things in, in local currency, that dollar is accretive to the overall return as well. So ultimately, if the dollar declines, remember the S&P 500 has a lot of multinational companies in there, and that may not be as beneficial for earnings that they translate back into a weaker dollar. So again, it's a way of thinking about the currency component as well as the relative cheapness. And this chart right here looks exactly like the growth to value chart as I displayed in the US. And unfortunately, Mr. Zuloff stole my thunder, uh, but that's what happens when you have titans of the industry talking uh, before you. Uh, they have good ideas uh, and, and you think you've stumbled on something, you realize that, of course, uh, the, the masters of the universe already know it. But what you see here is the European uh, relative performance to the S&P 500. And notice here, Europe has massively underperformed the US, not shocking given what I showed on the previous slide from JP Morgan. But if you look here, what you see is that the period of outperformance looks just like growth to value, right, in the US. So we know that the valuation is cheaper, but, but what you find is that, you know, even on these CAPE ratios, you're paying significantly less for earnings. And so ultimately, we think that that's, that's a pretty positive trend. Secondly, if you just look at Europe as a whole, uh, what you find here for pockets of the market, non-financial sectors, um, has a big gap in terms of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the CAPE ratios there. Now, there's a line there that says, whatever it takes. Uh, that was known to uh, Mr. Draghi out there when Mr. Draghi uh, gave that speech that Europe was willing to do whatever it takes to get things to grow. Um, and there has been a bit of economic malaise and growth within there. But if you look at the non-financial sectors, uh, they're still cheaper than the U.S. And the other way people think about financials, because financials have so much leverage within them, uh, you can still see that that market differential here, and we all know the story about European banks, how horrific it's been, even absent the arch, arch I'm not even going to say it, Archipago scandal or, or whatever that was, uh, the family office that, that took uh, down some earnings of a few of the investment banks there. Uh, but you still see that it's relatively cheap. So even again, looking at micro sector analysis, you find the same result. Um, but if you look at the rest of the world, once again, um, and you look at profit margins now, notice how profit margins continue to expand even during recessionary periods. And we both had a V-shaped recovery in the US as well as the rest of the world ex-US when it comes to profit margins. But notice here that margins continue to expand. Uh, but you also see that there is some mean reversion within profit margins over time. So we do still expect to see margins to grow, even though the profitability, I'm sorry, even though earnings have been strong, you also expect profit margins to grow. As an equity investor, that's the distribution that one receives. And then the equity market within there, the interest sector, once again, uh, looking at value versus growth in Europe, looks exactly the same as the US. So global value has massively underperformed as we've had this really scarcity of growth. Now, um, will we have scarcity of growth again? Uh, Mr. Zuloff said this morning that you know he expects that in a couple of years when the stimuli run out. That's assuming that we don't continue to do that. Um, but right now, you're poised for a good recovery within the value markets, both in the US as well as the European market. I know that's someone's question. Um, my thoughts on European equities, I think you see here that I'm arguing that I believe they're significantly cheaper. And as you also heard Mr. Gunlock say in our asset allocation programs, uh, that we started really buying uh, significantly more European equities over the last few months, um, both on the thesis of the downward looking dollar and just relative valuation. And so for those of you looking to uh, not really be that discerning about value versus growth, another way to think about it, just like in the US, you can focus on sectors of the market which screen cheaper than the overall broad-based market. And just like we have with the US uh, markets, we have a, a, a product that focuses on the European equity markets and uses Professor Schiller's CAPE ratio to distill what are the cheaper sectors of the market. Notice here, you get a different screening of, of richness and cheapness when you look at the European markets versus the US. There are different compositions. Uh, investors treat things differently. There's different behaviors. 
And a lot of the reasons for the European underperformance has been the European markets are more value centric. They tend to be a little more uh, cyclical in nature. And again, you can see that from the cheapness of the market. And so uh, for those of you looking for this type of exposure, uh, obviously we have the double line Schiller in inter enhanced international product. Um, and there's materials on that that does this process as well. So we think that this is a good time for investors to really, really reassessing their equity allocation. Not that you need to necessarily pare it down, but in general, it's that rotation that, that could be underway. Well, what about the rest of the world? What about the emerging economies? And so, um, uh, I, again, uh, Mr. Zuloff just front ran all my slides. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing to see that. And, and again, not even looking at his research, but what this shows is emerging markets relative to developed market equities. And um, I had to borrow this from Manac Advisors down in Australia because uh, he does great work. He loves long-term data. And I can't find any time series on emerging markets. It goes back to 1925. But what I like about that is look at the longevity of cycles, right? The longevity of cycles of outperformance, underperformance. There's two things to gleam here. Uh, one is the length of cycles used to be longer. Right? We all know that, that there's more information for more flow, more globalization, that transpires into quicker information. But also, if you think about what Mr. Zulov said, he was also talking about correlation to dollar strength and weakness cycles. That's exactly part of the play within the emerging market complex. And notice how emerging markets have significantly underperformed over the last five years. Uh, they've been underperformed massively by over 80% over that period. And so again, uh, you may want to you know, take his advice and think about timing, uh, but if you don't have a significant piece of your equity allocation within the emerging markets, I would, I would argue it's time to start nibbling into this uh, part of the market, start building those positions. You're never going to get exact bottoms correct, uh, but it is time to really start allocating away from this. So as you're seeing from these metrics, what you're seeing is this, this exceptionalism in the U.S., this outperformance of the equity market has ran for a long period of time. And I know the death of the U.S. equity market has been exaggerated. The death has been reported many times and it's still alive. Uh, but in general, over the long run, thinking about valuation, thinking about cheapness, uh, it's in our viewpoint, these other markets make sense uh, to really start getting to more allocation, uh, building those allocations. And again, profit margins, uh, as you'd expect, the emerging markets are significantly cheaper than the rest of the world. So I'm just layering this in on that side. So uh, we also talked about the dollar. Right, uh, I think you heard uh, Mr. Gunlock reference it. This is a U.S. trade deficit, um, and you can see here that it just continues to expand uh, from what we saw in the pandemic. And again, you look at China's GDP. Uh, we we beat this to death this morning, uh, but you can see that uh, obviously the money printing and our consumption behavior is really widening that trade trade deficit and those balance of goods. And so, um, if you think about that, what that does, it puts pressure on the dollar. And so, this coupled with the fiscal deficit, you see that. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of references about the technicals and, and things here. This is a short-term chart on the dollar, uh, but what you see here is that there's been a lot of volatility in the dollar. And that triple top that was referred to in the dollar back in March of last year coincided with the, the dollar top we saw in 07. It coincides with the dollar top that we saw post-election of President Trump uh, back in late 16 or really early 17. Uh, when he, he proclaimed himself the king of debt, and uh, I think he made good on his word uh, there, definitely uh, expand our deficit and notice that decline in the dollar. So um, although this chart on a short-term basis uh, makes one think that, well, potentially there's a term for a rebound here. I think short-term, we think that you could go test that 93 level again, um, just again, if interest rates continue to go up uh, and, and we get some uh, just some kind of weakness in the rest of the global world. Uh, but once you start to see this and see this reversal, we're looking for the breakdown below 89. And when you do the long term chart says uh, it should go into the low to, low to mid 70s. And so another way to frame the Dixie is to think about the outperformance of the S&P 500 relative to the emerging market. So what you have here is the dollar spot index. Uh, the dollar uh, dollar index, um, when it's going up, that says the dollar is stronger than the basket of currencies. And we, we juxtapose that against the S&P 500 relative to the emerging markets. So it's the inverse of that chart I showed before. And you notice here that they're not, they don't overlay great. And I'm not a huge fan of overlay charts and trying to distill correlation between it. But the directionality is what I'm looking at here. So if you notice here that when the dollar is having its strength, 
I tends to lead to US outperformance relative to the EM and vice versa, except in the last few months. What we've seen here is that the stock market in the US continues to outperform, even though there's been some of this dollar weakness. Perhaps the equity markets are thinking about you know, uh, the, the oncoming you know, rate rise in the US and that differential, but also remember, emerging markets were hit disproportionately by the pandemic. They've been hit as of late. The virus is spreading there. Only, I, I think the latest data I saw was only about 4% of the emerging world has a vaccination to date. And that's compared to the US, which is approaching 40% today. So yes, um, you can use these charts. You have to think about fundamentals. You have to think about the macro landscape. But ultimately, this chart augurs for uh, the emerging markets to outperform over the long run. So lastly, a topic we've been talking about significantly is inflation. And so what I want to do is address the idea of how do equities work in, infl in inflationary regimes and environments? And um, you know, I, I've heard, I heard post-financial crisis a lot from people that equities do well in inflation. And that's not what I was taught in school. And I don't think that I went to a poor school of, of thinking about this. Um, it, equities can stay in line with inflation if and only if companies have pricing power. So if you don't have pricing power, inflation is not good. Pricing power means you can raise prices commensurate to the right uh, the, the the rise in your input costs. And so uh, there is a misnomer or, or a misunderstanding about some inflationary regimes. Uh, if you look at Venezuelan stocks, you know Venezuela has had a disaster with hyperinflation. Stocks did very well there, not on a real basis, right? But they they kind of ultimately because of how much price pressure happened, they they stayed. Uh, relatively in line. They did much better than fixed income would, uh, given the devaluation of the currency. So let's look at different regimes for the stock market under different inflationary environments. And so if you take a look at kind of the bulk of equity market returns, and this goes back to uh, 1972, right? So you have 50 years of data here, various inflationary regimes. And you can see in there that first column or the, the second column that says percentage of the time from the left um, tells you that the bulk of equity market performance is between 1% 1, 1 inflation to 5% inflation. So you can stratify the buckets. You can see if you do one to three, which is the environment we've been in for a significant amount of time, you can see that the equity market typically generates positive rates of return, right? The median return is about 11%. The average is about 10, six. That's really the Goldilocks scenario or minimal deflation. Notice there, the best performing regime, although with only 3% of the observations, um, has a median return of 15% when you have slight deflation. The disinflationary environment is quite good. It's that 5% threshold where it really starts to erode um, equity market returns. And then when you have the massive, dis massive deflationary environment, that's really what also is impactful. I don't think there's many people here in the massive deflationary camp. I know we have a portfolio manager here that loves to tell us about deflation, deflation, and this last CPI rate. It's like, yeah, yeah, but saving, saving. I'm like, okay, you can stick to the deflation theme. We're going to know that, but we're not going to trade that theme whatsoever. But he's trying to play devil's advocate, and we really appreciate that. We don't like groupthink. We want people to, to try to poke holes in views. What you find here is that the sweet spot really seems to be where we have been. Um, and then you look at the price to earnings ratios. Well, notice here the most elevated PE ratios tend to occur in this part of the market. Why is that? Well, if you have strong performance, that strong performance leads to higher multiples. So if we start to see uh, US inflation pick up, you should expect some degradation in the multiple. So there's nothing wrong with degradation in a price to earnings multiple if it's the good kind. What is the good kind? The good kind is the E is growing faster than the P, right? E growing faster than the P, the ratio is declining because the denominator is increasing. That is a positive multiple compression. What you've seen in the equity market for the first or for the last two or three quarters, right? The multiple has compressed a bit simply due to the growth in E. That's a good thing. The problem is if there's a degradation in the price to earnings ratio in that multiple due to inflation, notice that you can see on average about a three to four point compression. And so that under that scenario, um, this is why inflation could be bad in the short term uh, for the U.S. equity market. And if you want to think about inflation hedges, and I know we've talked about it in various instances, instances, what you find is the things that tend to be the most correlated to break-even spreads. Now, break-even spreads are not actual inflation. 
Break-even spreads are market expectations of the future level of inflation, right? So the break-even spread says, this is the what price I'm willing to pay for inflation protection, right? And then you get the return either above or below that level. So what you see here, not shockingly, that the worst uh, asset when in break-even in, in spreads tend to widen and go up is that it's global government bonds. Well, they're fixed rate assets. They tend to be higher quality and they, they tend to really exhibit negative correlation. That is when break-even spreads or inflation expectations going up, global bonds do the worst. High-grade credit, right? Again, this is still from high quality assets. They tend to have significantly more uh, interest rate risk and that's why you see that component. Cash tends to be uncorrelated because cash isn't that volatile, right? So you can call it negative, I'll call it zero. Uh, we're all friends here, so we can call it that. But notice what we, we put the box around on the right-hand side are things like commodities. We've seen that over the last nine plus months, right? High yield credit, right? Why high yield? Because it's a lever play on the economic expansion. So it also tends to be a shorter duration asset. So it doesn't have as much interest rate sensitivity. It has more economic sensitivity. Again, why high yield has outperformed high grade credit today. And then lastly, developed markets tend to do quite well as well. So for those of you looking for ways to protect uh, some of your portfolio um, against um, expectation of inflation rising, and again, after some of the prints we saw both on CPI and PPI over the last two days, um, you know, I, I know that most of you are exposed to the developed markets, especially the U.S. Um, those, most of you probably have some high yield. I know that commodities have been underloved and underappreciated for many years, but also remember the commodities market has been underinvested in from a CapEx standpoint. So unless you're Mr. Zuloff and can time those markets quite nicely, um, we also think that it's a good position to be in to continue to build those commodity positions. And so um, the other thing we show here too is uh, a growth inflation regime. And a lot of people think this way. This, this was a, a framework that was kind of pioneered by Dalio and the folks at Bridgewater. Um, it's a basic economic analysis. Where's growth today? Is it, is it increasing? Is it decreasing? And that's on the, uh, the vertical axis. So high, high growth, higher than expected or higher than median growth, lower than median growth. And then when you go horizontally, that's inflation. Is inflation growing or is it actually declining from these levels? And so declining doesn't mean disinflation or deflation. It just means lower than the current level. And if you look at the regime we're in today, the upper right-hand side shows the returns in the higher growth, growth above expectations, and falling inflation. That's where we were last year. We have shifted and translated over to the left-hand side. And so if you see that too, what you see is that the, 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 the performance tends to be significantly better um, in these type of environments, things that exhibit higher correlation to the market, things like commodities, things like REITs, uh, emerging market equities. Uh, equities in general. So again, looking at that, if you look at the kind of performance expectation, that's the best type of environment uh, for those asset classes. And so, um, you know, uh, I, Jeffrey also ran, ran me on this slide. So I feel like uh, there's really no reason for me to give this presentation today. But one thing about the equity market, no matter how val how expensive you think it is, um, it's still not it's still not as expensive relative to bonds. And this is the chart he was referencing. And so this looks at um, this looks at the Schiller earnings yield. So instead of the CAPE ratio, you invert it. It's E over P now instead of P over E. So you invert the Schiller CAPE ratio and you compare it to the 10-year average of bond yields. So you're taking the, si the same contemporaneous time period, or at least the trailing time period, it's not contemporaneous, but you look at that 10-year time period and you say, okay, well, what does that look like relative to the yields I would get? And so you can see here that equity screen extremely expensive to bonds uh, in a historical context. The only time it was worse was in that pre-inflationary environment in the mid 70s. So again, um, there's a reason to hate bonds, especially sovereign bonds. There's a reason to hate European sovereign bonds and, and things like that with negative yields today, um, where a lot of them have really not, not much room to go except up. And as we all know, that duration cuts both ways. So lastly, too, um, if you want to give that equities are rich to something, the easiest chart to pull out is your commodity chart, right? So here we take the S&P 500 uh, uh, index. This is the price index. Uh, because there's no dividend, uh, no total return here. And the reason for doing that is because we compare that to the excess return on the commodity index 
which don't include the compound the the dividend component or the collateralization component is really the dividend component within the the, the commodity market and what you can see here is that commodities have never screened cheaper um, in in the limited time frame we have that limited time frame being only the last 37 years and so looking at the commodity market too uh, although it has outperformed the equity market as of late um, we just think that this thing still has legs to run. So another idea for the inflation argument is to maybe increase one's commodity exposure. Uh, you can you can take Mr. Zuloff's advice, wait for you know some reversal in the dollar to do so. Uh, but again, just understanding uh, the commodities market, the underinvestment there, not just by investors, but the underinvestment from the capital expenditure side and how long those cycles can be. Um, agriculture, the cycle tends to be a year. Why? Farmers have fungible crops. That is, they can replant, they can change the plant of their crop to take advantage of what is the highest priced asset at the time. So the cycle in agriculture tends to be shorter than others. Um, if you think about mining, mining tends to be one of the longest cycles on the other hand, because you have to dig in the mine. You can't just find a new mine overnight, it takes exploration. And those existing mines, you have to go deeper and deeper. The cost of extraction continues to go up. Um, and so not only are those longer term cycles, then you have the process of getting extracting the ore, move it to smelting plant, get it refined, and then distributing it. By the way, all of those take input costs of something called energy, right? And so we've seen what's happened to oil prices and energy prices of late. Yes, gasoline prices have and, and heating oil have had some uh, shocks into their market as of late, uh, given uh, the colonial pipeline. But in general, remember, when the shutdown of the shale fields happened last year, it's very difficult to bring them back online. Yes, you can bring them back online, but you have degradation of those wells as well. So I, deal, I still think oil prices continue to climb. Uh, I know that Kathy Wood's been a hot hand. She's talking about she doesn't think oil is going to hit 70. I would be very sketchy of, of announcing that when Brent crude is right knocking on the door. That Yes, today we had a little bit of a decline. Uh, it's been a good run, but I do think as we get more consumption back, we go through the seasonality that oil continues some of its grind as well. By the way, one thing I didn't mention on the commodity markets too, is that you get this uh, benefit of the backwardation of the market. That is the term, the term structure of commodity investing is giving you an incremental return premium because of the shape of the curve. The curves are telling you that the market is supply constrained relative to demand. And I only expect that to be exacerbated as we get pickup and recovery both of the European markets and ultimately through the European market. So that's my prepared comments. I know we've hit time, but I am gonna go over a little bit since I'm the closing speaker, I get the right to do so. That, and I got a lot to say, and I didn't get to say much today because I had the two Titans on this morning. So I'm gonna answer a few questions real quick. Uh, so there's a dog's breakfast of valuation metrics that indicate equity valuations are rich relative to history. Never heard that phrase, dog's breakfast, but I'll take your word for it. How does negative long, real long-term risk-free interest rate impact equity valuation? You know, that's a great question. And I, I joke that we need to go back and what's Fabozzi going to do when he, you know, he has to write his new edition uh, to charge you 400 bucks to get the latest version of the handbook of fixed income? Is he going to write a chapter on negative interest rates? Because there was always the hypothesis of zero lower bound. Well, I think what you really need to think about is it's negative real, as you say, uh, not just the negative nominal out there. But we go through cycles of this. And so I think the negative real yields are what are exacerbating uh, the equity valuations in the market. It's stretching other parts of the market. Remember when Ben Bernanke pursued quantitative easing post-financial crisis? What he talked about was talking about moving investors out the risk spectrum, right? Forcing them to take risk by extracting value out of the risk-free asset. That's exactly what quantitative easing does. But his thesis was predicated on something called the wealth effect. If you felt wealthier, you would still go spend more money. The problem is wealth is concentrated, especially uh, in a lot of financial markets, in the wealthy hands already. So it doesn't necessarily lead to this high, let's call it velocity, where $1 of incremental wealth leads to a dollar of incremental spending. Um, however, what we have seen is the reversal of that. With fiscal policies, you're now seeing that. And the fiscal policies are aimed at the broad masses. This is what we call Keynesian, you know, kind of supply side economics, where they're trying to generate demand. And in this case, instead of doing it through financial markets, direct to consumer, right? They're taking the, you know, the uh, cable cutter methods. They're coming directly to you. They're depositing it directly in your bank accounts. And so 
Um, I think some of that is going to change the idea here. And I think you, you're still going to have an expansion of consumption. Now, does everybody spend today and, and really rationalize that price to earnings multiple? Um, I think the jury is massively still out on that. But, you know, I do expect to see multiples compressed because of earnings growth. But again, it's undeniable you're paying there. So great question on thinking about the negative real uh, interest-free rate. Uh, but I think that's part of the valuation metric we're looking at. Um, at what point, the next question, what point do higher interest rates start to blunt the trajectory of the bull market? Uh, I, like, uh, I like calling it a bull market because the equity market has been strong. But when you think about higher interest rates, yes, they will have some impact on valuation. But remember, what caused the, the wiggleness or, or the this weakness, I should say, in the uh, equity market back in February? It wasn't the level itself of interest rates. It was the trajectory. It was the velocity of the move. It's how fast it was occurring. We moved almost 80 basis points over the course of about six and a half weeks. So it's that move where the market starts to extrapolate the move and says rates are going higher, higher, higher. It's incessant. Think taper tantrum. We had some wiggleness in that in the beginning. But let's take today. We're seeing a roughly, it's called a 165 tenure, okay? 165 tenure. Where was the weakness in the equity mark? Up market in February, 165 tenure. Where are stocks today? Stocks are higher than they were back in February. What changed? Did the market think that rates are going to rally? No. What changed is your reference point changes. Anchoring biases occur within markets. Uh, I like to use the parallel of someone going shopping for a home. And if you're going to buy a house and you haven't been in the market in a few years, and it's not, it's not as appropriate today, but you haven't been in the market for a few years, you say, hey, a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. Is 3% today. And let's just say interest rates go up and all of a sudden becomes four. You have sticker shock. But if that four stays four for a while, all of a sudden now you're like, well, that's just kind of what it is. It gets into the psychology. So I think that, you know, uh, there's not some magical level, it's the velocity. I think that current level, if you want to pin me down, is something about two and an eighth to two and a quarter. So call it between two and two and a, two and a quarter percent, I think would, would cause some trouble. But I will, I will hedge my bet there and say, if that happens in a linear fashion over the next six months, it doesn't cause a problem. If it happens over the course of four weeks, it's a problem because the market will say, oh gosh, here comes inflation, bond market knows about it, and that's what happens in the market. So I don't think there's magic numbers when it comes to that. I think it really comes down to the idea that what you find is that it's velocity that does that. Um, so let's see. Um, someone's asked about inflation. I covered that. Uh, okay, the next one's a, a very good one too, and it'll be my last question, and, and we'll let everybody go uh, for the session. So, will emerging market policymakers be able to tighten monetary supply and tackle large fiscal deficit when economic conditions improve? Does this hurt the setup for EM relative to, to outperform DM? So, I think it becomes a question of how they're funded. Are you funded with externalities? Do you have foreign direct investment within those emerging market economies? Or are you dependent on your own economy? How are you also financed? If you're financed dollar denominated, um, does, that, does that impact as well? And so I think the biggest impediment to this is strength of dollar, right? So strength of dollar, right? Because if you're indebted in dollars and you don't generate local dollar, lo your local economy doesn't uh, generate dollars, it generates local currency, your payback is now higher than it would have been absent that dollar move. So I think at the end of it, the policymakers will have to tighten policy if you see strength in the dollar. And I'm not talking about the Dixie going from 90 to 93 or 94, like we've been talking about. I'm talking back to that double top or triple top, Dixie back north of 100. So there is a lot of room in there. Yes, the world is awash in dollars. We saw there was a big supply constraint last year. That's why the Fed had to really open up direct swap lines with other parts of the world. Uh, back in March of last year, really to get that flow of dollars going back in there. But I do think that you've seen that. You've seen uh, some emerging market countries actually tighten monetary policy already because they have some inflationary components or they're trying to battle the weakness of their currency as well. So uh, I think that that policy uh, behavior really stems from flow of capital as well as the direction of the dollar. And so uh, to me, it's not a concern today. I'd be concerned if I saw that the Dixie or or even that local currency index going up, let's say, 7 to 10% from today's levels. Uh, but that's something that's not one in our forecast. 
and really it's a long way from uh, transpiring. So with that, I really want to thank everyone for their time today. I want to thank everybody for spending uh, the last two days with us. I really hope you got something out of this. Hopefully there's some tradable ideas out there. Uh, hopefully you learned a lot along the way. Hopefully we tried to make it a little entertaining. I know it can get boring talking about bonds and inflation and economic data for two days straight, but we really appreciate you tuning in. We look forward to, to meeting with you and having more conversations about how we can help you try to achieve not only your goals, but also your clients' goals as well. So thanks again for tuning in, and we look forward to continue our communication and your experience with DoubleLine. Thanks, you.